I have a unique look. From maybe the age of 13 or 14 to now, I've always had this cookie cutter exterior and a metal interior. See, I've been this bubbly and generally average dressed person, but I've liked and still like the murder, the scandal, and the mayhem of storytelling, and especially Hollywood storytelling. Maybe it was because it was something I've never experienced before. It was taboo on my back porch. But for some reason, I've had this interest of dark Hollywood history that sparked from a young age. Like I said before, I have a unique look. Listener, I bet you can relate. I would say that my interest ignited from watching E's Mysteries and Scandals and was cemented by reading Hollywood Babylon by Kenneth Anger. Even though I now know the book is mostly made up, the stories put me into a flurry of research. I needed to know more. I wanted to know more. Because, for me, every trial, scandal, and murder was fascinating. Especially Sharon Tate's. She was a girl that was about to start her life. She was young, happy, and in love. What really shook me was that she was killed in an environment that was safe. She was in the hills. She was with her friends. And yet, she was slain. Even though it can be argued that it was her mistake to trust the strangers that came into her safe space. Human nature should not evolve into the aspect where manslaughter would and should happen because it can. The taboo of it all was that she was acting based on trust and respect, and because of it, it got her killed. But she wasn't alone. There were other people murdered too, and they matter. This special episode is going to be dedicated to three things. The other victims of the Manson murders that have been discarded under the limelight of the Hollywood elite, the paranormal accounts associated with the gruesome reports of Sharon Tate, and my own personal connection to the murders. Yes, listeners, when you grow up in a turbulent city like I have, you are bound to meet some people that were hurt in the storm. If you are thinking that this episode is drifting away from our usual themes of the paranormal, or that we are trying to become a true crime podcast, don't worry. The topics of the curious monsters, ghosts, and history are rampant in this tale. Also, our podcast is about the peculiar, and it would always be about the peculiar. Additionally, I want to preface that I will not focus my energy solely on Sharon Tate's murder. However, I will discuss the paranormal aspects pre- and post-the murder from other reports. If you want an in-depth account of Charles Manson or Sharon Tate, Karina Longworth has done a fantastic version of that in her podcast, You Must Remember This. I also want to preface that I will not in any way glorify these massacres. There's a strange ideal in Los Angeles where the Manson family are considered innocent or just in these killings. On the anniversary of the Tate-LaBianca murders, People go to El Coyote and ask to sit in the Sharon Tate table. See, for me, I might have interest in the homicides, but I have no joy in the unthinkable concept that people can act in an unexplained way. That in a solid incident, goodness can die within us. These slaughters are not positive, and the perpetrators deserve to rot in the jails they created. I want to say that this will get to the crux of the stories. So if you're sensitive to tales like these, please check out our other episodes. And yes, listener, viewer discretion is definitely advised. But if you will join me, welcome. My name is Ellie, and this is my Tales of Two Cities special episode. Hello? Welcome. This is Flames the Two Cities. Oh, I'm so excited. Even though it wasn't my original idea to include Shorty Chase's story, 
I felt uncomfortable ignoring his murder and discussing the La Bianca ones. Shay was a human being, too, that was shadowed by the other famous murders. He was someone that counted, and he deserves recognition. Donald Jerome Shea was born in Massachusetts on September 18, 1933. Like anyone moving to California, Shea wanted to be an actor, but eventually found himself spending time at Spawn's Movie Ranch, a 494-acre ranch used as a location for Western movies or television shows. The owner, George Spawn, hired Shea to be his horse handler, which gave Shea the opportunity to look for acting jobs on the side. His friends would even let him use their phone numbers as an answering service, giving him enough chance to leave the ranch when opportunity called. Shea was a big, stocky man who got along with everyone and thoroughly cared and looked after George Spawn's interest. Being the friendly guy he was, he was generous and welcoming towards Charlie and the girls when they first moved in. However, as a smart man, he grew to dislike Charlie. Shea had married a black woman he met in Las Vegas, and even though they separated, they were still civil. Charlie, a ginormous bigot, treated Shea terribly because of it. It got so bad that eventually things started to boil over. On Saturday, August 16th, 1969, the police raided Spawn's ranch to arrest the family on theft charges. Charlie was convinced that Shea was the one that called the police, and for him, that was the end for Shea. On August 28, 1969, Charles Tex Watson, Bruce Davis, Steve Grogan, Bill Vance, Larry Bailey, and Charles Manson took Donald Shea for a ride. It was friendly at first, but then Grogan struck Shea with a pipe wrench, and Tex stabbed him repeatedly. It was six against one. Shorty never had a chance. They took him out of the car, brought him down the hill behind the movie ranch, and finished their slaughter, stabbing him to death. Donald Jerome Shea's body wasn't found until eight years later. Steve Grogan drew a map, leading the cops to Shorty's body to prove that the body hadn't been, as previously rumored, cut into pieces. It wasn't to say that he was remorseful, just to expel the gossip. Here is the 1977 news clip about finding Shorty Shea's body. The body was buried into the side of an embankment about 150 feet off the Santa Susana Pass Road, one mile west of Topanga Boulevard. L.A. County Sheriff's investigators received information to look in this area about six weeks ago. and have been digging along the hillside ever since. Sergeant Bill Gleason, who's been on this case for eight years, talked about the information that led the investigation to this particular site. Information we received in the past from various people who have since grown up, uh, when they were with the Manson family, they were very young, they've grown older, and they decided that now was the time to let Mr. Shea be found. Now, do you feel that this is the man? Uh, He is not beheaded. He looks like he is all in one piece, which goes against what was said during the trial. Well, that was just a rumor going around. I think that was uh, told by some of the so-called Manson family people just to make people uh, pay more attention to what they were doing or just to embellish on the death of Mr. Shea. How do you feel after being on this case for eight years? Well, I'm quite pleased that we finally found him. It's been quite a search. When I decided I wanted to do this episode, it was because of the La Bianca murders. While I knew of the killings from a young age, I always thought the La Biancas were in the same house of Sharon Tate. I mean, if you think about it, the massacres are generally referred to as the Tate La Bianca murders. This really got me thinking, do I know anything about Leno and Rosemary La Bianca? 
Or do I only know about the famous people that died on Cielo Drive? The answer was that I didn't know anything about the La Bianca half. I didn't know anything except on how they died. That's what this idea originally stemmed from. I wanted to give them the recognition they deserved. I mean, I would want that if that happened to me. Rosemary La Bianca is believed to be born in Mexico on December 15, 1929. Reportedly, her parents were Americans who either abandoned her or died prematurely. She grew up in an Arizona orphanage and was adopted by a Californian family with the surname of Harmon. In the 1940s, Rosemary met Frank Strutters while working at the Brown Derby on Los Angeles, now known as Mess Hall. The pair got married shortly after. They had two children, Susan in 1948 and Frank Jr. in 1955. In 1958, Frank and Rosemary got a divorce. A year later, she met Leno La Bianca while working as a waitress at the Los Feliz Inn. Now it's that fancy Starbucks on Hillhurst Avenue. The two fell into that deep pit of love and rushed to Las Vegas to get married. Rosemary got along with Leno's children, and her classy style and fashion sense was a big hit with Leno's daughter, Corey. Leno's first wife, Alice, stated that Rosemary, quote, showed Corey new ways to wear her hair and spent time doing things with her that I didn't have time for, end quote as well as being a happily married wife and terrific mother slash stepmother. She was also an independent businesswoman. She converted an old Gateway Markets truck into a mobile dress shop called Boutique Carriage. It bloomed, and with a partner, Rosemary opened a dress shop slash gift store on 2625 North Figueroa Street, now a Chevron station. She made several investments, in stocks and commodities and suddenly became a millionaire. In 1968, Leno, Rosemary, and Frank moved into Leno's childhood home on Waverly Drive. Once they did, odd things started to occur. Rosemary told a friend, quote, someone is coming into our house while we are away. Things have been gone through and the dogs are outside the house when they should be inside, end quote. This wasn't a new occurrence for Leno. When he was in his late teens in August of 1943, the house was robbed while the family slept. In May of 1969, the robberies seemed to cease. Rosemary wrote to Corey, writing, quote, We haven't had any more robberies, but every time I come home, I expect to either find someone in the house or something missing. I think the police have stopped working on the case, and we haven't heard anything from the insurance company." End quote. In August of 1969, Rosemary's son, Frank, spent a week vacationing with his friend, Jim Safi on Lake Isabella. Leno drove up to the lake and dropped off his boat for the kids to use. On Saturday 9th, both Leno and Rosemary went to visit the boys and let Frank stay another day with the Safi family. Later that night, Rosemary, Leno, and Susan left Lake Isabella and got home around 1 a.m. They dropped off Susan at the nightstand for a paper and a racing form. Rosemary, like anyone in the 1960s, was scared and disturbed by the Tate murder. I mean, it was a new era of not trusting your fellow man. It's a scary thing for anyone to comprehend. She went to bed and Leno fell asleep in the living room reading the sports page. She awoke at gunpoint with Charles Manson standing over her. She was allowed to put a dress over her nightgown and was led into the living room where Leno was tied up. Charlie and Tex Watson reassured the couple that they wouldn't be hurt and that they were just robbing them. After taking all of the cash, Tex took Rosemary into her bedroom and placed a pillowcase on her head and gagged her with a lamp cord. When Leno started getting stabbed by Tex, Rosemary screamed, What are you doing to my husband? She flailed around the room, blinded by the pillowcase on her head. The girls, Leslie Van Houten and Patricia Kerwinkle, 
called for Tex to help, and Tex lunged forward and stabbed her until she fell on the floor. The girls joined in. In the end, she was stabbed 41 times. Rosemary LaBianca died shy of her 40th birthday. She was cremated on August 16, 1969. Here is a clip from Leslie Van Houten and Patricia Kerwinkle on what they did. Once again, a group drove toward Los Angeles, only this time, Manson was at the wheel. Manson told us he chose this residence, the home of a supermarket chain owner, because he'd once been to a party at the house next door. Inside, Rosemary LaBianca was getting ready for bed, while her husband Lino was reading the Sunday paper with its headlines about the Tate murders. Then Manson walked in the door. And I seen uh, a guy sitting on the couch. <laughs> and I laughed at it. He said, hi. I said, hi. And Tex came in. Manson gave Tex Watson leather laces from around his neck to tie up Lino LaBianca. Then Manson left without leaving any fingerprints. I told the other dudes, I'll see you later, man. You know, like, I'll catch it on the run, man. I'm gone, man. And I split, man. Did he leave instructions? Yeah. He told Tex, um, don't scare them like last night. Manson was gone by the time Pat Krenwinkel and Leslie Van Houten made their way up the driveway. The minute we walked in the house, it became clear that this was not what I had imagined. You know, before that it had always been um, an abstract kind of thing. And when it was the real thing, I um, was absolutely torn in half. Watson, armed with a bayonet, stayed in the living room with a bound and gagged Lino LaBianca. Pat and I took Mrs. LaBianca into the bedroom. And um, the sounds of Mr. LaBianca dying came into the bedroom. Horrible, guttural sounds. She started calling out to him and yelling for him. And um, at that moment, for a brief moment, I, I realized, you know, these are people that love each other. And Tex came in and killed her. And then Tex turned me around and handed me the knife and he said, do something. Because Manson had told him to make sure that all of us got our hands dirty. And um, I stabbed Mrs. LaBianca in the lower back about 16 times. And there was no pity? No mercy, no. No. Leno LaBianca was born Pasquilino Antonio LaBianca in Los Angeles, California on August 6, 1925. He shortened his first name to Lino, which was his grandfather's and his father's middle name, an Italian tradition. Both of Lino's parents came to America and opened a grocery business called Gateway Ranch Markets and State Wholesale Grocery Company. Lino went to Benjamin Franklin High School in the Highland Park neighborhood and excelled. He was part of the track team. He skipped a grade, and he generally was well-liked by everyone. Like any kid of foreign parents, though, people had trouble pronouncing his name, so he decided to change the I to an E. Hence comes Leno. Leno worked for his father at Gateway Market. And on his free time, he went to places like the Hollywood Roller Drome, which is now Tellison Park, the Sycamore Drive-In, which I actually can't find any record of, and the Pasadena Civic Auditorium, which is still there. He would frequent those spots with his high school girlfriend, Alice Schofield. According to Schofield, Lino was quiet, shy, and equipped with subtle humor, and had a great capacity for getting himself innocently into all kinds of trouble. In the 1940s, the LaBiancas bought a home on Waverly Drive. Once Leno started college life, he enrolled in Los Angeles City College, which is still there, and studied business administration. 
After one semester, he transferred to USC. In November of 1943, Leno got drafted. He was sent to Fort MacArthur in San Pedro, California, and became a member of the 524th Military Police Battalion. A month later, he and Alice got engaged. They married in March 1944, and in September, Leno was sent off to Europe for 18 months. When he came back in 1946, Leno had moved from technical sergeant to sergeant first class. Coming back home, Leno's parents wanted him and Alice to live with them, but Alice wanted to start their own life. Because of Leno's struggle to satisfy everyone, the marriage faltered and Alice left him. However, that wasn't completely the end, because they managed to reconcile and eventually bought a house in Alhambra. In the spring of 1948, Alice gave birth to Corinna Jane LaBianca. Two years later, Leno joined the board of directors and became the vice president of both Gateway Market and State Wholesale. That December, Anthony Carl LaBianca, Leno's son, was born. As years went on, Alice decided to get a degree in accounting, and Leno became the president of Gateway and State Wholesale after the death of his father. The amount of work became overwhelming, and soon they started to move apart. In January of 1955, they separated, moved out of the home, but also had one more kid before the marriage fully ended. In December of 1955, Luis LaBianca was born. In 1959, Leno met Rosemary Strutters, and, well, you know their love tale. However, let me add some more. Leno became tired of his life in Gateway, and with Rosemary, he dreamed about moving away from their Waverly home to raise and breed racing horses. When, in August of 1969, after driving back from Lake Isabella, they dropped off Susan to pick up a racing form. The reason why was because Leno was an avid gambler and spent a lot of time in the racetrack. Charles Manson and Tex Watson woke Leno up at gunpoint. He was told that they were only there to rob them. Leno was asked if there was anyone else in the house, and he said that his wife was still in the bedroom. Manson went into the bedroom and returned to the living room with Rosemary. After collecting all the cash in the house, Manson had Tex bring Rosemary back into the bedroom, put a pillowcase over Leno's head, and then gag his mouth with a lamp cord. Charlie left, and within a few minutes, Leslie Van Houten and Patricia Kerwinkle entered the residence and were instructed by Tex to go to Rosemary's bedroom. While gone, Tex began stabbing Leno with a bayonet. Leno screamed out, stop stabbing me. The stabbing did stop, but only temporarily. Tex went into the bedroom and attacked Rosemary, then came back and found Leno still alive. So he continued stabbing. And when he stopped, either him or Patricia Kerwinkle carved the word war in Leno's stomach. Patricia admitted that she stabbed him a number of times and left a carving fork in his stomach and a steak knife in his throat. The girls then wrote, Death to Pigs, Rise, and Helter Skelter on the wall in the refrigerator in Leno's blood. Leno LaBianca was laid to rest at Calvary Cemetery in Whittier on August 16, 1969. He was 44. Here is a continuation of that Diane Sawyer clip. After that is a word from our sponsors. Before they left, Tex Watson stopped to take a shower. The women took a snack of chocolate milk and cheese. And then... It had been said by Charlie to make sure that there was all these witchy signs. And I went and Mr. LaBianca was already dead. And I had gotten a fork, and I stabbed him with a fork repeatedly and eventually left the fork in him. We all come here for one major thing, 
we love the paranormal. Whether ghosts whispering in your ear, or alien lights blinding you from above, we always like to question and explore the unanswerable. That's why Parabox Monthly is a fantastic service to satisfy those thirsts. Wonderful. Parabox Monthly is a subscription box service that sends you a paranormal puzzle with every box. Every month, they ship out a strange and unique paranormal-themed shirt, which contains hidden clues for you to solve their riddle. If you're skilled enough to find the end of their hunt, you'll be entered into a drive for additional merchandise. Attention! To help carry on our important work, I want you to join the Secret Squadron. If you wanted to experience the escape room next to Bigfoot, this is the company to do it. Their paranormal themes have included ghosts and haunted locations, UFO encounters and aliens, folklore and legends, cryptozoology and urban legends. Oh, well, you'll love. I never seen the like. Never did. Man. Also, if you're worried that you'll be stuck in a contract system that would never let you out, <coughs> don't worry. You could cancel any time. So, for paranormal or supernatural fun, go to www.paraboxmonthly.com and use our code Two Cities at the checkout box. Two Cities, one word, to get 10% off your first box. That's Two Cities in the checkout box for 10% off. Golly, Chief, I hadn't opened up the box yet, but I'm going to now. Enjoy your search. Obviously, we love stories. So it's no surprise that we're bibliophiles. We love books, we collect them, and that's why we're so excited to tell you about Bookishly. Bookishly.com has a range of things for book lovers, including monthly subscriptions from teaandbookclub.com. You can choose between tea or coffee and either a vintage book or a new copy of a classic book with a design created exclusively by Bookishly. And they truly are beautiful. Bookishly is a real dream come true for anyone who loves books, bringing you a wonderful surprise each month. But don't take my word for it. Check it out at bookishly.com or sign up at teaandbookclub.com. Prices start from $18, including shipping from the UK. And for our listeners, the code TOTC will take 10% off your first three payments at teaandbookclub.com and 10% off orders on Bookishly. That's code TOTC for both teaandbookclub.com and bookishly.com. Even though... I will not discuss the circumstances of the Sharon Tate murder. I can't ignore the paranormal claims associated with her slaughter. Like the story from Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, who claimed strange occurrences would happen after he bought the Cielo Drive home. He noticed the lights would flicker and noises would occur. However, one of the most prominent experiences he had was when he took a photo of an orb with a smaller orb inside the bigger orb. He believed that was Sharon Tate. But the main story I'll focus on is the story from Hollywood Haunted, a book from Lori Jacobson and Mark Wanamaker. It's a good story, and it involves another celebrity years before Tate's time, Paul Byrne. For those that don't know, Paul Byrne was an MGM producer and husband of legendary actress Jean Harlow. His story is equally unique and mysterious, so if you would like to learn more about his tale, please let us know. I would love to tell you. But, for now, let me tell you the shortened version. Paul Byrne either committed suicide or was murdered in his house on 9860 Easton Drive. That address is important because it was the house of Jay Sebring. Yes, one of the many victims during the Cielo Drive massacre. The Easton Drive home has been rumored to be jinxed. Paul Byrne was either killed or murdered. The owners after that drowned in the pool. And Sebring? Well, you know. While Roman Polanski was away, Sharon Tate would spend her time with friends because she felt uncomfortable being alone. One night in 1966, Tate was staying in the Easton home that night, she started to feel weird. Well, actually, her exact words were funny to reporter Dick Kleiner, who wrote about her experience. She was scared out of her wits and lay in Sebring's bed, wide awake, with the lights on. Suddenly, she saw a creepy little man come into the bedroom. 
it was clearly an apparition. She felt like she knew who that spirit was. It was Paul Byrne. The creepy man ignored Sharon and sulked around the room. He was seemingly looking for something. Sharon put her robe on and followed him. Halfway down the stairs, she was frozen in her tracks. What she saw not only scared her, but Kleiner as well. Tied to the post was a figure. She couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, but its throat was cut. She ran into the living room and tried to pour herself a drink, but she couldn't find the liquor. For another strange reason, she felt the strong urge to press on one of the bookcases and open it to reveal a hidden bar. She started to have another urge, and she tore away wallpaper at the base of the bar, uncovering a solid copper base. Confused? Well, so was she. She finished her drink and headed back to the bedroom. The ghostly phantom was still there, but the man was lurking in the upstairs hallway. She, however, managed to make it to her bed and instantly fell asleep. The morning after, Tate woke up relieved that it was just a terrible nightmare until she realized that the wallpaper was torn away. She had seen Paul Byrne and possibly was warned of her nightmarish fate. Growing up in Hollywood, I was surrounded by a series of family friends equally obsessed with the golden era. When my parents would drag me to their parties, there would always be 1930s music playing in the background, and we would be drinking water from glasses salvaged from some starlit tome auction. Phrases like, oh, do you like that mirror? That's from Pickfair. Or the railing is from the Brown Derby was a general theme of my family friends' conversations. While those stories might seem impressive, nothing comes close to, well, let's call her M's. M was a friend of my mom's family friend who eventually became a big part of my parents' social gatherings. M was an enigma because despite being the only person with the best stories, she always kept a tight lip. She too grew up in Hollywood, but more under the glow of the golden era. Her dad was a hairdresser for the elite, and her house reflected that with a varying degree of headshot autographs thanking him for his amazing work. She even admitted to going to appointments with him and confessed that at 13, while waiting for her dad to finish with a client at a hotel, She was hit on by Errol Flynn. But one dinner party was when she really began to open up. I had recently confessed that I had read the paranormal book discussing Sharon Tate's murder, and she said quickly, Oh, I was good friends with her. Actually, M was good friends with all of them, even Rudolph Altabelli. When Altabelli moved back into the house three weeks after the tragedy, He asked her to stay with him the first night because he was terrified. She did and slept on the couch in the living room, the very same couch where three weeks prior her friends were tied up on. The most haunting thing about her story was how she said that blood was right beside her, Sharon Tate's blood, and Pig was still on the door. When asked why she did it, She said it was the last and only way she could be with her friends again. Music is I Need to Start Writing Things by Chris Zabriskie. If you haven't already yet, please subscribe to us on SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, and iTunes. We're also on Stitcher. Give us a shout out there. Please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. It really helps us a lot. If you would like to listen to weird stories about your state, please let us know. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on our email at tales of the number two cities podcast at gmail.com. We really love connecting with you and learning about the world we live in. If you haven't heard yet, we also have merch. We're creating more and more designs each day. Please check it out on T Public and search Tales of Two Cities Podcast in the search bar. The Nikki and Ellie drawing and the retro ones are my favorite. 
Also, and most importantly, thank you so much for listening.